My name's Rick Nelson. I'm a descendant of the Jar Jar Wurrung people. Um, today we're at the southern end of Jar Jar Wurrung country. We're approaching Mount Granok and we're going to go up the and have a look at the surrounding landscape and explain a little bit about that and how that was back in the early 1800s. We are just north of Ballarat and most of Jar Jar Wurrung country is to the north, east and northwest a, a bit more. So we're at the southern end of Jar Jar Wurrung country and, and yeah, we'll, we'll just explain a little bit how this country might have been. Okay, I'm Barry Golding. I live in a similar landscape to this over near Krusheng, another uh, scoria volcanic mountain like this one. So where we're standing at the base of this this mountain was actually a basalt flow and the rocks around us which are basalt uh, and scoria some of them are really light they got chucked out of the mountain top up uh, up the top there's a number of other volcanoes nearby um, over to one side we've got mount glasgow it's another volcano and there's a whole heap of other volcanoes or scoria cones down to the south uh, and over towards Dalesford. Um, so when we get up the top of this hill, we'll see a whole lot more appear. They're the ones uh, in the Hepburn Shire. Two of the biggest ones uh, would have been called Crudesheng and Murakai. Uh, they've still got their names. A lot of the other ones, have, we call them by other names. But when Major Mitchell came over this hill in 1836, he called them Mammaloid Hills because he reckons they look like breasts in the landscape. So that's how how they got their names. So it's worth sort of establishing why this area became important and why we're going up to the top and why we've included it in this tour for you. So basically a basalt flow came from this mountain and from a whole lot of other mountains around two million years ago and it covered the whole of the ground around here apart from a few of the bigger hills with a whole lot of rock which has since eroded. It develops amazingly rich soil and it became a pretty rich landscape which was rich for Aboriginal people and it's also rich uh, for the pastoralists who came in following Mitchell in 1836 and today it's typically used for sheep and cattle grazing. Uh, up towards the top of the divide, it's used for potatoes. It was also rich for gold. The gold underneath these rocks was in the gravels. We call them deep bleeds. And so the white mullock heaps that you see in the landscape around here were mined in the 1860s. So basically, these ribbons of lava were like volcanic highways. And they weren't just important for Aboriginal people to get around, but they became important for the early uh, invaders, colonists, who came over these grasslands. And uh, that's basically why May Major Mitchell came here, because he was following an existing highway. 
Uh, and Mitchell put Mount Greenock on a map because he followed this line and people who followed him called it the Major's Line. Uh, he came through in a wet year, there were wheel tracks in the, in the landscape and people followed it. So I might just flick now to Rick who might talk about who might have been living in the landscape and maybe talk about the clans and that sort of stuff because what you've seen, let, you know, to talk about what Mitchell might have seen when he came down the highway. Well, basically, there was around 20 clans in the Jar Jar Wurrung Nation, spread over, it's basically around 2,000 square k's. Goes from between Creswick and Ballarat down to around Macedon, and up, up north to up near Kerrang, and then west again over to Charlton and St Arnold and back down through Avoca, back down to uh, near Creswick. So there was around 20 clans there. In this area, we would have had about three or four clans uh, around us here. Some over near Maryborough, there, there was a clan. There was a clan around Dalesford and Mount Franklin, and another clan over towards Castlemaine. So there were three or four clans probably in this area. And as you can see, um, it's quite an open grassland. These were original grasslands, it wasn't completely wooded. There was open grasslands. Aboriginal people would tend to do camp on the edge of the wooded areas so as not to be seen and vulnerable out in the middle of the open grasslands. The landscape would have been yellow from the yam daisies or the murnong daisy. This was a staple uh, fallback diet for the Aboriginal people. A and Augustus Robinson talks about coming over Smeaton Hill or, or Mount Karuchiang. Virtually as far as the eye could see, the fields were yellow. There was open fields of yellow, um, the yam daisies. And as he got down to the foot of Karuchiang, um, he came across 20 to 40 women all digging up the yam daisies. The men were going off into the um, red gum forest and, and the women were digging up the yam daisies. So what, what we see here in this, um, uh, these open fields around Mount Greenock were probably um, originally like this, I would say. Um, Barry, do you agree with that? Yes, well, uh, there's, there's a, at least about maybe 30 or 40 scoria cones which, which have got this breast-like shape uh, in the landscape, and each of these would have uh, would have would have had names. Each of these would have had really rich grasslands beneath them. They would have had springs coming out of them. So, uh, if people had uh, access to a bit of timber towards the bottom, that'd be an ideal place for creating a semi-permanent campsite. And so. A lot of these had ovens down the base of them where people cooked for hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, they'd come back to the place. Obviously, in the grasslands, you couldn't have a fire without wood. Uh, there were no wood deliveries <laughs> in those days. So people really had to have their oven somewhere near where there was trees. And they're often sort of adjacent to the red gums where there was plenty of, plenty of timber. Bit of shelter, bit of water. And as you say, Rick, a lot of lot of yam daisies. So maybe uh, maybe you might like to talk about um, the clans around this area and uh, what we know about them. We know that there was one clan um, just over the way ar around Carrollsbrook. Um, we know there was a greenstone um, quarry there where. where the Aboriginal people would get quarry the green stone and, and uh, make them into axes, stone axes. So we know there was a quarry and a clan around Carrollsbrook, over the Castle Main, down, down towards Kyneton, down towards the Compaspe and Colliburn Rivers. Um, the Gal Gal Balug people um, lived over there. Yeah, there's three or four clans around here. We know that. Mitchell came up onto some of these mammaloid little hills, um, using them for for high points to, to look out at. And, and Aboriginal people have done the same thing, um, used the high points for, for lookouts. You know, you could see the smoke off in the distance 
later on you could even see dust from horses um, cantering and galloping along so th these hills also um, were important for Aboriginal people for, for lookouts as well.